For 50 years resident in London, he is one of the world's most famous Australian poets. A lifelong student of literature, he also has a profound love and great knowledge of music. Grateful for decades of his advice on the subject, I personally arranged the cushions. Peter, you know more about music than any man I've ever met, but you're not a musician, are you? No, it comes in my ear, and out of, it, through my ear, I think I get to work with it, you know. I, I mean, basically, the point about, about music is that no matter how much it's put on the page, it, it, is, it is sound, and the same thing is that the notes on, on the score just have to be made into sound. Well, I want to get to that, because I, for me, music raises the, the big problem about uh, modern art in modern times, is that at some stage, serious music got beyond me, and I think it was at the point where you had to be a musician to understand it, and that's something mu music hadn't claimed before. And music up till that point, I think it probably happens about halfway through Schoenberg, somewhere around Verklärt and Acht, up to that point, you didn't have to be able to read the dots to love the music. And then after that, I think you did a bit, and I think something got lost. Well, except I think the music was claiming a lot of other things before it claimed purely the expertise of being able to read the scores. That is to say, with Wagner, it was claiming to be up there with Schopenhauer. It was up there with the boys that knew what was happening in the world mind. Up there with the Nibelungen and, the, uh, yeah, and all that. But, but that was those ordinary legends, the Nibelungen. But what Wagner was trying to do, and a lot of other people, I suppose, around about that time, they were trying to be transcendental. And it seems to me that music is, always claims to be transcendental better than any of the other arts. And of course it's got some truth in this because it isn't, a, it isn't a, a language of meaning, it's a language of association. Well I think Debussy listened to Wagner and, and he, Debussy pushed music somewhere it hadn't gone into further and further harmonic subtlety but the day came or the night came yeah. when Debussy sat there in Paris at the first night of something by Stravinsky, I think it was Rite of Spring or something, I said help I don't understand it. On the other hand he had sat down with Stravinsky and played the Rite of Spring two hands, uh, two pianos together so he knew something about by it. By the way I understood it, by the time by the time Rite of Spring got to me I understood it so maybe... It did to me, Rite of Spring literally in my way when I just left school was the first work of, of musical genius I went out and paid money for on 478 Columbia Records. Who was conducting it? It was Stravinsky himself, himself yeah. and uh, with the Philharmonic Orchestra of New York. Uh, I had that uh, set, sort of yeah. green cover. Yeah. 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 And you know, it, it seemed to me, I, admittedly I came across it as all uninformed people did in those days by watching Walt Disney and of course I didn't know until I listened to it properly that Walt, that uh, Stokowski buggered it all about and changed the order of the works. It was in Fantasia, wasn't it? In it was Fantasia, a, yeah, was a section um, of Stravinsky. But I mean, I think on the other hand he was right in some ways. I still think the dinosaurs being overwhelmed by volcanic upsurge is a better interpretation than the sort of thing that Dzerzhinsky actually did on the stage of the theatre. Yeah. Anyway, the, Stravinsky's ballets were certainly absorbed, but then even Stravinsky got to the point where he wanted to write, or thought he had to write, in, what is it, eight tonal or twelve? Well, he only came to that towards the end of his life, when he, uh, after having gone through many vicissitudes, because one of the things that's interesting about Stravinsky, I think, is that no matter where you take Stravinsky's work, from the very earliest work, the Russian-type work, through the neoclassical works, you know, the Violin Concerto or the Persephone, and then later on when he became a follower of the Schoenberging system, he never sounds like anybody other than Stravinsky, no matter how much he was imitating. I mean, Constant Lambert mocked him and said, one day he'll be just, he'll be writing Grieg. Well, he did. He wrote something called Four Norwegian Moods, which is full of Grieg, but he still sounds like Stravinsky. I mean, I think it's true to say, I know it's a, very much arguing after the event, but a genius is a person who can absorb any number of influences and remain himself. Yeah, but do you, I, I think in Stravinsky's case, it's, it's a clear case that the talent is so strong that it will stamp everything he does, no matter what system he adopted. Yes, but uh, let's go to some other modern musicians and let me ask you if you really like them. I can't help noticing every few years there is a great sale goes on in a, uh, any classical music shop and it's once again some new attempt at, at releasing the works of Schoenberg has failed and all the LPs or tapes or whatever they are available at a very low price. In other words, Schoenberg has never really become 
popular, and I've, I've got a feeling it's because he never became popular with me. If you can't, don't become popular with me, you haven't become popular. Well, Did he become popular with you? No, he didn't actually. Although there are pieces of his I do like. I think the, about, about, the point about him is that he was a, a man who always wanted to be unpopular. They were pretending that he wanted to be popular. He, 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 I think he pretended he wanted to become popular, but there's, there's a piece of his where he says, uh, here, a piece of writing, where he says, uh, I think I'd like to write something like Tchaikovsky, and of course it would be better than Tchaikovsky. Well, of course it wasn't. Because... Well, that was a pretty absurd statement in the first place, really, because Tchaikovsky was a very great musician, and why didn't Schoenberg spot that? Well, because I think there's a kind of terrible snobbery attached to lots of attitudes towards the highbrow arts. But, but, but even then, I don't like the concept of highbrow and lowbrow very much, because it seems to me that there's a great deal of, of simple and beautiful music in a lot of works which are considered complex. I was listening on, on the radio the other day to, from, the, from the Met in New York of, of Wagner's Parsifal. Now Stravinsky said about Parsifal uh, that it was the ultimate vulgarity because it was an attempt to turn art into religion which you can't do. But in fact, listening to it going on and on, it does go on and on, uh, you, you begin to appreciate that provided you understand what the man's doing. It is in fact a great work. I mean, you, it, you can't really lay down the coordinates of art. You've got to say whether they work or not. And in advance, it's critical. Why I hate Boulez, for instance, I do, do think Boulez is a very bad man because he's an inter terribly intelligent, brilliant Frenchman who can do anything. And without, he has not the inkling of what human beings really want to hear from the art. I had this conversation, the one we're having now with Boulez, at a, at a lunch that was thrown by my newspaper, The Observer, when I was still working for it regularly, back in about 82. Uh, the editor threw the lunch, and there was Boulez sitting there. And I raised this question. How is uh, Schoenberg to be made popular? How are you going to make ordinary people listening, listen to very advanced music, such as your own, I said. And he had his answer ready. He said, by force. Well, indeed. Well, by for he meant it. But the only, uh, the only real force which, which uh, people of that opinion have is well, two forces, I suppose. One is fashion, and the other is making certain that no other rival music is produced, that all the subsidies go into the orchestras that are going to do the right thing, and, and all the academies will chuck out anyone who doesn't follow the pattern. Of course, this doesn't exactly happen. But you know, I know a lot of artists who, and I think this is true of music as all the other arts too, who simply get frightened when they go into the academy because the academy tells them that it's absolutely they must do this. Well, and if they go right. against it, of course, they, they won't get preferment. They won't get uh, uh, Boulez was out to frighten and impress people. His academy, his electronic academy, yeah. was designed to do exactly that, intimidate everyone. It actually killed a student, which I thought was quite good. I'm yeah. I'm bound to say that I receive that news as one that receives the news that some car bomber has blown himself up. Well, he's a bit like that. I mean, of course, funnily enough, Boulez is also, also an old-fashioned French patriot, and so he doesn't find it at all difficult to conduct Ravel and Debussy, and even for that matter, a lot of other music, French musicians. But he just, and he loves the Germans if they are the central Germans. And, but maybe, he, and maybe he wrote something that I would like. Did he, incidentally? Is there anything No, he's never written anything I've liked. I mean, I, I've, I, you know, early on I used to have a lot of friends that were composers. I used to go along to have on guard concerts, and I heard things like, you know, Le Mat Le, uh, <coughs> The, the Matter de Saint Maitre and uh, those early Boulez scores. But for me, they had something which I couldn't take. There was so much of what I call the high tessitura instruments, far too many struck gongs and, and xylophones and strange things which people found washed up on, on Javanese islands. It's I mean, getting it's into sort of John Cage territory, isn't it? The prepared piano and. Yeah, the... but the funny thing about Cage and Stockhausen is that they are more somehow themselves. You can, you can feel about them that they're going their way. You, you might not like it, it may be crazy, but it's their way. Uh, with Buddhists, I always think it's compromised by somehow being underwritten by Descartes or someone like that. I must say I would like to hate Boulez, having met him, but I think I'm probably at my best as an amateur music lover when I, in spite of myself, I discover something in a musician that I love. And that's what happened to me with Wagner. I wanted to hate Wagner very much. I disliked everything about him. I disliked his style of life. I thought his wife's memoirs were one of the most horrible books I'd ever read. I thought his opinions were filth. <laughs> and still think that his opinions were much, much closer to Hitler's than scholars allow. That Nazism really wouldn't have been quite what it was without that. He's in every way a detestable man. And yet, when I first heard the Good Friday music in Parsifal, I realized that was a great work. And the, the, the last pages of Gotterdammerung and the magic fire music in Valkyries, 
I find that stuff absolutely irresistible. Well, I think people, uh, I, I think creative artists uh, uh, have a wonderful fire door between their moral selves and their creative selves. And I just don't think, even though they may, in fact, import from their moral selves the more repulsive aspects into their creative selves, they, they become transfigured once they get into the, it, transfigured would be a word which Wagner would love, for Klärung in Germany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and must, it, use word, yeah. must use word. Must use word. transfiguration. That's right. I, it seems, it, I'm always skeptical of morality seen outside specific human actions and I don't actually I don't agree with you about Wagner's character I don't think he was anything like so vile he was the sort of man it's perfectly true that you you, you could come home and find him in bed with your wife and before he'd left uh, he would have borrowed 10,000 yeah. marks from you but that's one side of his morality I don't think that he was so repulsive okay he was anti-semitic but then so was everybody else I mean he was there were a lot of things about him which were which were very selfish, but I don't think he was, he, he was anything like so vile. I mean, he would have regarded Hitler as an absolutely contemptible little imp, you know, he wouldn't have had any snob, time for it. Because he was a snob too. That well, was, maybe, but it was also because he knew that Hitler was a complete fraud. You know, the only person Hitler really liked in music was Franz Leher. I mean, true, yes. and, and... The uh, idea that Hitler was a Wagnerian and Beethoven and Meyer was a bit of a... Not true, thing. not true. I mean, the, the point about Wagner, Wagner's music is there is in early, early Wagner, particularly, uh, you know, many... What, Rossini called Merve Cadeur, you know, many bad quarters of an hour that you, you've got to get through. But once he... Once you get to perhaps the end of Langren, and you get through uh, uh, the ring, and you go on to Parsifal, uh, this is a this is a consummate and fantastic genius of a man. And not only that, I would think in the case of Tristan Isolde, he created the single most remarkable and most innovative piece of music the world has ever known. Right? He may not be the greatest composer. He's probably not as great as Bach. He's not as great as Mozart. But he was. But they wouldn't have done that. I, mean, I, I remember the first time I heard it. I think I bought the LP that had. Uh, Laurie's Milky or Lottie Lehman on it. That's, a, that's the first act of v v v Valkyrie, wasn't it? That, yeah. uh, yeah. Which, which, which would be the uh, the love duet that I had then from... Uh, that's it. That's, it ends in the first act. Yeah. Oh, Tristan, that's a big part. Yes. In Tristan, yes, the, the, it, it would be that, yes. And, well, it uh, is, yeah. It's in the second act of the Tristan. I just played it until it wore out. Yeah. And I was putting the case extremely. I, did, I don't like the man. I do admire the composer. And I was trying to raise, incidentally, among the redeeming features, even in his anti-Semitism, is that uh, Thomas Mann's uh, father-in-law, who was a Jew, old Pringsheim, uh, helped Wagner build the Festspiel House. Yeah. And Wagner's letters of thanks to Pringsheim were the only things that the family took into exile. Yeah, uh, it's also true to, 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 to say that Wagner's great, admittedly he teased him, but Wagner brought forward lots of Jewish musicians, including Hermann Levy, who was the man who conducted the first performance of, of, uh, of uh, Parsifal. And uh, Wagner took him over, conk took him from Brahms. Now, Brahms was completely free of anti-Semitism, but nevertheless, Levy thought I, he'd rather be with this anti-Semite whom he thought was the great man than he would be with the with, with Brahms who was a totally free of that. I can see the uh, point. I said it too extremely, although it's worth saying that uh, that a man can have detestable opinions and still uh, and still be a great artist. But the, the point I really want to raise is it's one thing to say that, that uh, a music like Wagner's can challenge all conventions, which it did, including symphonic conventions. It's operatic music that isn't really symphonic. It's something else. It's dramatic. It's what Shaw described it as. It makes sense only as drama. It's that, that's, that's one kind of advance. But the technical advance that the atonal composers made is a different kind of advance, because, for one thing, I can't follow it. Well, it's based on a wrong, wrong premise, it seems to me. It's based on a premise that the principles of music, which up to that date, uh, were basically what now we call the tonal system, had been exhausted. What Schoenberg meant was that he didn't particularly value the competition that he would be up against. Uh, I mean, he didn't do this consciously. This was his, how his unconscious worked. And the ha seven other people had been doing it. It had been, or it, Wagner had began to make it more chromatic. Then it began to get with other pe people following on. Uh, but of course, what you, you have to bear in mind when you go back in history, you realize that people at the time of Oscar de Pre and that sort of thing hadn't yet actually produced a system which was completely uh, total. And in fact, that music goes in and out of its of its affections, you know, in and out of its styles. The idea that a style has to be replaced by another style is 
basically a phony idea, but it's one which is pervade, pervades all the art, doesn't it? It pervades painting, it pervades literature, it pervades... In many ways, it's what modernism is. It's the idea that you, the technique becomes self-conscious and then fatally, in my view, becomes part of the subject matter. And people are looking for a kind of... They're looking for a sort of easy, a kind of open sesame, which will be different from the usual policy. I mean, Mozart, I mean, it's fascinating to read Mozart's letters about how he was traveling around Europe. He knew he was very good, gifted, but somehow he couldn't find the formula to open the doors to himself. And it only was in the 19th century after the idea of the musical genius got established, I mean, the particular kind of musical genius, uh, that you realize that if you couldn't open the door to patronage by being the sort of person whom the, the, the boss class wanted to use, you opened it by producing a magic formula that you were going to change the nature of the art, and, and that opened the doors. Well, for even you. Yes, in that respect, even Beethoven did a better job than Mozart, didn't well, he? Well, Beethoven was a fantastically successful man. I mean, there's a story, isn't there, that he was standing with Goethe on the ray, wayside once, and the emperor went past, and uh, Goethe bowed low, and Beethoven said, people like that should bow to us. I mean, he was a huge... Uh, a huge public relations man, but Mozart wasn't like that. He always he'd eaten too long below the salt, you know. Was, um, the, was it Go was it Goethe who decided that Beethoven wasn't quite good enough to write an opera with him, or vice versa? No, no, it was probably vice versa. I mean, I mean, no, no, no. Certainly, Goethe, Goethe had great respect for, for Beethoven. Uh, let's, let's, I interrupt you there, and I shouldn't have, because you're saying that uh, with Mozart, the musicians were still below the salt, and well, by Mozart Beethoven's was, under... Mozart was in fact a Mozart and Haydn. Uh, sorry, Mozart and Handel are two of the remarkable people who managed to live completely as sort of, well, Mozart in the case of first, first, first de Mier, really, he became a freelance, and Handel had always been a freelance. Uh, but it, Beethoven was the man who, who told, you know, bosses that they had to listen to him. But the thing was that Mozart tried to do it, and, and he, he, actually, there's a new revisionist idea put forward by people like Robbins Landon and that kind of thing, and that um, Mozart, in fact, had an income in the year he died as big as Haydn's. But it is revisionism, though, because it, the story of Mozart's career is missed opportunities. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. For example, Munich yeah. would have taken, should have taken Mozart oh, on, yeah. never did. There's a magnificent letter extant which I've read, which is wonderful, in which the, the man who later became emperor. Uh, <coughs> Front, not not Joseph uh, Leopold II, who was at that time Grand Duke of Tuscany, and he and he was uh, he writes he gets a letter from his mother, who was the Empress Maria Theresa, saying, "I understand there's a couple of low-life characters hanging around your court of the Mozart family. For God's sake, these kind of you know worst sort of peddlers get rid of them. They only they're only trouble." <laughs> and this letter exists. Uh, I think but, it was uh, the musicologist Alfred Einstein, and not the the physicist Albert Einstein, the musicologist Alfred Einstein, who said, uh, the question is not what would have happened if Schubert had lived as long as Beethoven. Uh, the question is what would have happened if Schubert had lived as long as Mozart. Yes, yes that's right. Yeah. Uh, because Just Schubert, years difference. Because yeah. Schubert was 31. I mean, 31. Uh, was he the most talented well, musician? I think he was the most talented musician who ever lived. Yeah, that's my view. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but so I think God is a spiteful fig figure, and God sort of sort of thought, you know, uh, if you can't have any more of this, so uh, drag him off. I mean, there's a passage in Berryman's poetry. You know, I mean, I, I, you and I probably have slightly varied views of Berryman. I still have an affection for him. He's a very weird I, poet, but great I mean, talent. Who yeah, occasionally wrote great poetry. He, he has somewhere a passage in one of his. Pa uh, I think it's it's, it's what's well, in those sort of Henry poems, and uh, that he talks about. Uh, he said Henry had been thinking, and he'd contrasted the career of Mozart and the career of God, and God had come out second best. <laughs> and there is a, a, a feeling in this sort of thing that there is some... I mean, I have these arguments with my wife, for instance, who, who thinks that we ought to be all of us. She's a, she's a colonial analyst. She thinks that um, it's very, very bad to be over-worshipful of great geniuses. And I remember... Russell Davies, your friend Di Davies, once did a caricature of me, which I'm seen in a rather woolly sweater, sitting below a plinth on which is a, a big bus which says, Un Maestro, or something like that. And, yeah, I have, I have an overdeveloped bump of reverence. Well, same here. In but fact, I've been accused of that. <laughs> and, I, and I think we should keep our bumps. Yeah. Well, because I think it's very important to realize that there is such a thing as really extraordinary gifted... T there are... There are 
talents and gifts around which are, tra are absolutely unimaginable. And you, you just don't know how or why. I mean, God you know, who created them doesn't care. Yeah. It doesn't look as though he cares. Yeah. I, mean, I think there's a Greek, there's a Greek outcry from characters saying, "You gods, you play with us." Ketli or yes, D Z or yeah, yeah. And by killing, by killing Schubert, that was. Yeah, as I said, for, on the other hand, it did allow him to write 1,600 compositions by the time he was 31. And I got in, I actually got in through the piano sonatas played by oh, Schnabel. They're wonderful. And yeah. I think, yeah. and I think in my last years, mm. which aren't all that far away. That will be my consolation music if I can yeah. still hear. I would rather think rather fondly of what Robert Browning said he wanted to do at the end of his life. He wanted to sit down and learn Greek. Well, I don't have such fi fine ambitions because I could never learn Greek in a million years. But I mean, I, I, you can see that what one really wants to do at the end of one's life, I suppose, is suddenly stop contending. And, uh, and I actually have a vision of, of the hell of my last years in which I would be too deaf to listen to Beethoven. Yes. It's a bad joke. Yes, yes it's, it's, it's a good joke because Beethoven was too deaf to listen to Beethoven. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but there, there's a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier, is that in the late quartets, which I came to quite late, I was a, a, a more than mature man when I first heard the late quartets, there are such divine simplicities, like in Opus 127, there's the most beautiful melody you ever heard. A melody, it, it, it's, it's practically make-out music. You could play it to a girlfriend. Yeah. And, uh, and I think... It, I've got a feeling that all great art, art has simplicity in it somewhere. It does, There's but it doesn't have only that. It has. But lots, it has a point of attraction. It, it has, like, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the one of the things which worries me about certain kinds of approach of simplicity, like some of the present day English composer John Taverner, um, it's, 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 it's. It, to be divine, it doesn't have to be simplistic, and and there is too much simplic, simplistic art around at the moment. I mean, it. it the, 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 the simple nature of, of, of say, a, a Mozart melody in, in the Magic Flute, um, the little, little sort of Viennese songs of which are given to Papageno. Um, but at the same time, Mozart gives you a good deal of counterpoint as well as elsewhere. And I, I'm very sceptical of too much simplicity. Yes, you, in fact, you will never use up the complexity in, in Mozart. You know, I merely meant that great art tends to give you a way in somewhere. But, the, oh, yeah. but what it leads you into is something is labyrinthine and, and complex beyond exhaustion. It's on the nature of the, of, the, of the, you know, the individual composer. I mean, I always think when I listen to somebody by Bach that he's, um, he reminds me of the old joke that, you know, I'm sorry I had to write you uh, such a long letter, I hadn't got time to write a short one. And, <laughs> and there is that sense in Bach all the time that he, in order to be what he wants to be, he has to give himself difficulties. And, but the difficulties actually are resolved, really, in the hearing, because they don't turn out to be so difficult. It was one of my first great experiences uh, in music. I, I, I taught myself to listen in the sense that uh, when I first got to university in the late 50s, I had a few friends who had records and they recommended them and I would take them home. And, uh, and I found my way around. And I found, uh, for example, the Bach Magnificat spoke straight to me and, and opened up Bach for me. And forever, I'm still listening and still finding out about the cantatas even 40 years later. One of the things I find fascinating about music, which is not actually true, unfortunately, of literature, is that the, the more perfect the work, the greater number of pieces there will be. I mean, I mean you, you, you can't think even, I, I don't think except perhaps for George Herbert in poetry, and his work is not all that prodigious, that's not such a large amount of it. I don't think of, I can't think of any writer who, whose level of ach achievement is so consistent as say uh, Haydn's is or, or Mozart's is. Um, and the funny thing is, the, with, with composers, the more perfect they are, the more they produced. So this idea of Weber and that you spent your life just perfecting one little diamond of a work seems to me to be erroneous because though very heavily productive artists, so those who do a, write a great deal also write most perfectly. People have told me that it's all over, that the age of the maestro was the final blow, that the emphasis shifted from composition to the conducting of music that was already there, that really we're in a museum. I think that's true in a way, but um, it's a, such a well-stocked museum, I don't think we're too worried about it. I mean, it, I mean, but the maestro, do I do agree with. I mean, I think the maestro is a disaster in many respects, and I think the idea that uh, you, know, you have to have these central figures. I mean, 
one of the things I think is about the great, one of the great shames of the whole human race, when I really want to say to someone, what do I think is most shameful in humanity? I say that Elizabeth Schwarzkopf got more money for singing one Schubert Lieder Abend than he got in his whole lifetime. And this is what, it is, it is that sort of star, big name, the big entrepreneurial promotions, the big conductors, Maestro Schulte, you know, and apparently the, the timpanist said, I hit the, hit the timpani particularly hard because I think it is Maestro Schulte's head. There's, there's too much uh, Maestro worship, but I'm bound to say that Schulte once, when I was filming in Chicago, uh, he was rehearsing uh, in the Chicago uh, Opera House. I think it was the Opera House, the concert hall, whatever it is there in Chicago. And uh, and he was he actually called me to him backstage. There was no one in the auditorium, but he was taking a rest backstage. And he'd read my book, Unreliable Memoirs, yeah. and told me in his thick Hungarian accent how much he enjoyed it. And I was I was more than oh, well, yeah. I was more than flattered. I melted. He said, "I'm going to do something for you." He said with his Hungarian accent, and with his Hungarian accent, he told me to go out and sit out in the auditorium. And he came out. And he conducted the opening bars of Thus Speaks Zarathustra just for me. Oh, well, yes. And I thought, well, that wasn't bad. But, you know, but the real reason I'm grateful for him, although I objected heavily to the way he conducted Wagner, I thought it was far too vertical, I think he did a, he did a, a set of Eugene Onegin, which is the best I've yes, ever I heard. Know, yes, 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 I think I when a conductor can rescue a work or give it the definitive interpretation, as Cariani did, did yeah, the Well, record. I certainly wouldn't want my view of Schulte to be sort of the he was the worst. It's just the whole, it, they're all of them. They're all of them in this kind of vein. Um, some of them do good work. I mean, uh, Andre Previn, for instance, commissioned a number of people I know f for compositions, which, which wouldn't have come into play if he hadn't commissioned them. I mean, I'm all in, all, I mean, I have to have star quality people, but I don't want, I, I, I do want, I should say perhaps, more emphasis on the fact that in fact, the practical musicianship does not depend wholly on these great central maestri. Peter, I think there's a lot more to be said on that subject. We're almost starting another subject about music. Uh, it's been a delight. Uh, let's do it again and explore exactly that area. Thank you very much, Peter Porter. Yeah.